Hello chaps and chapesses, and this week we're going to talk about how to catch a bonefish on a fly. I think in saltwater fishing quite often we get very het up on catching the bigger species. We, we get very het up on targeting permit, tarpon, giant trevally, all of those bigger species which probably are slightly more dramatic. But I think every single saltwater fisherman cuts their teeth on bonefish. And bonefish are a phenomenal species to target on a fly for so many different reasons. I like to liken them as they're an honest fish. And what I mean by that is if you get your cast right and you get your presentation right and you've got a pretty good idea on what fly to use, they will probably eat the fly, which is a very rewarding experience for people who are taking their first steps into the salt. If you are considering taking your first steps into the saltwater realm, a bone fishing trip should be very high on your agenda. Don't try and target some of the bigger species first. Go and try and catch some bonefish, get a feel for the flats environment, and get a feel for saltwater tactics, saltwater techniques, strip striking, fly choice, rod choice, using higher line weights. All of these things are vitally important before you then take your next step. So I love bone fishing. Bone fishing for me is one of those wonderful pastimes where it's all about the visual element. I absolutely love being able to sight fish for these guys in crystal clear water and very, very shallow water. Quite often you'll see them tailing, which gives you a really good point of focus to put your fly, but also you will find them across sand flats and marl flats and huge different varieties. I think in some ways the poor bonefish get a bit of a hard time because they're one of the prey species that many of the other bigger species are trying to eat. So if you are in the Caribbean, you have them permanently being targeted by barracuda, by shark, by even birds quite often will try and attack them. So they're quite a timid little fish, but they do offer a huge challenge to the fly fishermen. In some ways, it's quite often the step from freshwater to saltwater. You're using a lot of those similar techniques. You're casting accurately. It's a bit like dry fly fishing or nymph fishing, and I think it's far more like trout fishing than salmon fishing. Salmon fishing is very much covering water systematically, whereas bone fishing is much more about sight fishing. And that, to me, is what makes it so incredibly exciting. And those people who tell you, oh, don't go catch bone fish, they're easy. I bet they've never tried to hunt really big bone fish, singles and doubles, because they are extremely cunning. They don't get that size for a reason. And so what as a species do they offer? Well, I think bonefish are a little bit like a saltwater grayling in some ways. They move around in schools and as they get bigger, then they start moving into triples, doubles and big singles quite often you'll find near the edges of blue water. They're an incredibly powerful fish incredibly powerful. I love watching the face of people who hook their first bonefish and just watching their face as this thing just takes off. So a salmon or a trout is often clocked at swimming at about six or seven miles an hour at full chat. Bonefish have been clocked at over 30 miles an hour. Now that is going to give you one hell of a fight on light tackle fly rods. So bones move in and out on the tidal fluctuation just like all saltwater species, but in particular you will find they are the first species that come up onto the flats as the water is just high enough. They're trying to get away from the predators in the deep water essentially. So you will find them sneaking onto the flats quite often with their dorsal and their tail fin out of the water and they're trying to get high up to get to rich feeding grounds which have been exposed probably at low tide and they can go up and target their main prey species which are crabs, shrimps, small mollusks, even small gobies and small fish that they will, um, they will go after. And depending on which area of the world you are depends on which prey species they are targeting which therefore defines which fly choice you're going to make. Normally bonefish feed up tide and what that means is as the tide pushes across the flats the bonefish will work their way up and that's because when they are tailing down in the water, uh, the tide flushes all of the sediment 
across from them so they can see what they're targeting. And what they do is they come in, you'll find these little holes all over the flats, and they'll come in and they blow a jet of water down into the marl or the sand, and that is how they expose their prey. And then they come in and they crush it with these big crushes in the back of their throat. And quite often they'll move as a school, and you'll have outlying fish which are more like markers and they almost keep a lookout if you like. Some of the fish in the middle, Craig Matthews for example, actually thinks that the middle fish might be asleep when you find them in that sort of mediatory phase on the flats. So as the water's really skinny, they'll come up onto the edges, they'll come up onto the flats, and that's where the flat, flats fishermen can first begin to intercept them. So you've decided to make the leap, you're going to go and do your first saltwater trip. Where are you going to go? Well, there's a lot of different destinations to go bone fishing. I mean, there's Belize, Bahamas, Mexico, Seychelles, Venezuela, America. There's, there's lots of different things. So which one do you pick? And if you are going to have your first saltwater fishing experience, I'd highly recommend you want to go somewhere where there's plenty of fish. In my mind, two of the best operations are probably Mexico and Belize. Those are great places for your first saltwater experience. And once you've got to grips with how the flats work and how bone fishing operates, then you can then branch out and maybe do Cuba or Venezuela or, or the Seychelles or something like that. It's, it's important that you get amongst lots of fish because you need to practice. You need to get used to targeting fish, you need to get used to strip striking, you need to get used to a host of different techniques that you probably haven't come across. And equipment. You've got to start wading around or fishing off the front of a boat or taking direction from a guide. All of these things take a little bit of getting used to. So you've picked your destination, you're there, you're on the flats. You're either going to be on a flat skiff, which is like a small flat bottom speedboat, and you will be on the front of the deck and you will have a guide on a polling platform behind you and your guide will be there to point out the fish to you. They normally work off a clock face system with 12 o'clock down the middle of the boat and then they will give you a distance and they will give you a trajectory and then hopefully you will begin to pick up fish. In my mind, wading can sometimes be slightly easier. Um, I like to be on my feet. I like to be able to approach in a stealthy manner. And I find for me personally, that's the way I enjoy my bone fishing the most. It also means that if you are going to a destination which is wading, if you are a shared pair between one guide, it means that you don't actually have to sit and watch your other partner fish, which is quite an important point. Because otherwise you have to come up with some kind of rotation system. Each person gets a crack at the fish or a certain amount of time or something like that. So you need to learn to take direction from your guide. Working with a guide is the best way to learn this environment. They have been there for years and years and years. They have a wealth of knowledge of tidal movements and different spots where fish tend to congregate. This is your chance to extract all of that information straight out of the guide's head. So what gear do you need for your first saltwater bone fishing experience? Line weights, generally line weights, anything from seven to nine weight. Uh, some people will use a six in, in somewhere like Mexico where the fish can be quite small, Belize some of the fish can be challenging, so six weight can be a lot of fun. But generally people normally use a seven or an eight weight. I personally veer towards a seven weight these days because with modern rod technology you will find that a seven weight will do pretty much everything that an eight weight will but it will also give you a very nice light presentation and I prefer that especially when fishing in very skinny water which means very very shallow water. It allows you to put the fly down nice and gently but a seven weight will still carve a line into the wind without too much difficulty. We're going to use a seven weight on that you need a reel. The reel is almost more important than the rod. A, a reel with a decent drag is absolutely vital when fishing in the salt. You need to have a reel which has a capability to stop because as I said, these fish can travel at 30 miles an hour. So therefore you need a reel with a decent drag system and it needs to be salt waterproof. It doesn't have to be too aggressive for a bonefish species, but on that reel you need preferably something with a wide arbor and then I like about 250 yards of 20 pound bracking. You don't need anything more than 20 really. If you want to use braid, you can, but it's a little on the excessive side. Then you want a bonefish fly line, something with a nice long head. I like long headed fly lines, mostly because of the fact that you can get a gentle presentation at distance. I'm not a great fan of the bullet tapers on the front because they do tend to come down with a bit of a bang. So I like the longer tapers. So I'm using things like the uh, Hardy Saltwater. There's a lot of very good bone fishing lines on the market these days. After your rod, reel and line, 
Then we're going to look at leaders. Most people just use tapered leaders, uh, the Rio Bonefish leaders, hard saltwater mono. You're probably going to use 9 to 10 feet, something like that. In skinny water conditions, I like to then put maybe 4 or 5 feet of tippet material on that. And you match that appropriately. So if you're using a leader which ends in a 10 pound point, don't use 15 pound tippet because Otherwise, you're going to find that your taper will be a bit peculiar. At the end of that, I always fish my bonefish flies on a loop knot. I always use either a perfection loop or an improved perfection or uh, a Duncan loop or something like that, which um, I've done demonstrations of in various other videos. This kind of loop allows the fly much more mobility. So if you're pulling it, you're not going to suddenly get with a fly coming at a cocked angle, which the bonefish don't like. Anything which is unnatural, they're not a great fan on. Fly choice. Now, fly choice is one of those things which is very personal, um, but at the same time, has to be practical. There are several patterns I never go anywhere in the world without. The first is a gotcha. The second is a bonefish bitters. And the third would probably be something like a tan squimp or some micro shrimps. I really like the little micro shrimps. And bonefish also eat crabs. Have some crab patterns in your box. Make sure that you are, have got a good selection. Rather than having one of everything or two of everything, I would buy probably six of different sizes. And more importantly, on lots of different patterns, you want lots of different weights. So you may have one pattern, but you may have it in three different sizes with maybe lead eyes or dumbbell eyes or stealth eyes, because then that allows you to target fish in different water heights. When thinking of flies, take advice from your guide. Obviously, they're going to know exactly what flies you're going to need for the appropriate destination that you are fishing. But also think of the bottom color. So the bottom color is normally what would dictate what color fly you're going to use. So you want to use dark browns on turtle grass. You want to use tans on sand, those kind of adjustments to your thinking. You might want to check out my top 10 bonefish fly patterns, which is quite a good start if you're going to start building a saltwater fly box. So we've got our rod reel lined, we've got our flies all sorted out, uh, and then we get to wear all sorts of very peculiar clothing, which sometimes makes us look like pirates. Why do we do this? Sun protection. Hopefully most of these destinations are nice and hot. And that is another reason why I love bone fishing so much. You can get out of the cold, drizzly winter that we often have here in the UK. As a quick rundown from top to bottom, a decent cap with a peak, preferably with a dark underside, which allows you to spot uh, more easily. Vital are a decent pair of Polaroid sunglasses. If you can't see the fish, there's no point in being there. It's very difficult to catch fish you can't see, and a decent pair of Polaroids is really crucial. Different tints uh, will give you different abilities in different light conditions, and if you look here, this is a video that I did earlier on different sunglasses. Then a buff of some kind, I tend to wear ones which are linked into the neckline, on the uh, guild shirts that I wear. Then you want either shorts, or I actually wear tights underneath my shorts because then I have to worry about sun cream or any of those kind of things. And then down to a decent pair of boots. And pick your boots on where you're going. So if you are gonna be fishing in the Bahamas or something like that, or it's white sand flats, easy peasy, no problem. You don't have to worry about wearing big clumpy boots. You can wear some neoprene style boots. But if you're going anywhere that has coral, I would highly advise you to invest in a decent pair of proper boots which will protect your feet and your ankles. Lastly, you need some kind of pack. Um, for bone fishing, something like a flats pack. You don't really need a big backpack. You don't need to carry a second rod. You literally want to keep it light. You want to be traveling very, very light. So only a couple of fly boxes, leader materials, forceps, other bits and pieces which you will find useful on the flats. So all of that can just go around your middle. A uh, bottle of water is always a good idea because you never know how far away you are going to be from the boat. So let's talk about tides quickly. Bonefish tides, in my mind, the easiest way to understand them is to think of a normal distribution curve. And ideally you want an incoming tide coming up to a high tide point and then going out again. And depending on which area in the world you are, that is going to give you a different height variation. And if you're in the Caribbean, it's gonna be 50 centimeters to 75 centimeters, something like that. Whereas in the Seychelles, it could be 10, 12 feet, which is pretty key to figure that out because you might suddenly find yourself in hot water, so to speak. So take advice, find out which tides are going to be best for which destination. Most of us operate on tide chart systems these days, so it's very easy for us to dictate which tides are going to be better. Then you have the two different tidal phases. You have spring and neap tides. Spring tides over the full moons, 
and uh, the new moons and neap tides, which are the smaller tides, would be in the intermediary phases. Depending on which destination you are, sometimes spring tides are better because you get a big flush of water. Certainly for the bigger species, spring tides can be more preferable. But for bonefish, quite often neap tides can be a really good choice because you can then find that you have a stable height of water and the fish have a longer period on the flats for you to target. So we've discussed tides, let's talk about environment. Saltwater environments are hugely varied and that's probably what makes them so special. You never really know what environment you're going to be targeting on and you can adapt to all the different environments that you come into contact with. There are such areas as marl flats, which are soft. Those are generally fished by skiff because obviously you'd sink up to your thighs immediately, which either that or you're going to get a really good workout. And the guide will then be able to skim the skiff or pole the skiff and put you in a position where you can target those fish, generally speaking with the wind across your back and over your right shoulder preferably, so that you don't start hooking yourself in the face or hooking your guide on the back cast, which is a really bad idea. Then you have turtle grass flats. Turtle grass flats are normally on hard coral. You'll find these in places like Turnip Atoll or Los Roques in Venezuela. And this is normally a really good hard wading destination. And there you will have the chance to encounter fish which are tailing normally in big schools. There's nothing quite like seeing a bunch of tails as the sun drops down in the evening. It's quite special. It also gives you a little flag to point at, which is very useful. Then you have sand flats, big open sand flats. Now, obviously, when you first think of sand flats like the Bahamas or the Seychelles, you think, wow, they're going to be easy to see. I'm going to be able to see those things from miles away. But bonefish are very well camouflaged. And the reason for this is the whole of the side of the fish is silver. So those silver scales have a purpose. What that does is reflect everything around it. It's like a stealth system for fish. And that means that sometimes they can be very difficult to spot because when they turn sideways, they almost vanish. You'll be absolutely gobsmacked. You'll think, where'd it go? It was there a second ago. I'm sure it was. And then suddenly it'll turn around and you'll see it that way. So the key when you're hunting bonefish is to look for movement. Movement is what attracts your attention. So as you're scanning left and right, you want to be looking for movement and that will allow you to pick up the fish and target them. Your guide will help you massively in this situation when you are first getting used to it. So you're wading across the flats, your guide is on your shoulder and he points out and whispers, bonefish, one o'clock, 50 feet or yards or meters or whatever you've, uh, depending on where you are. So what do you do? The first thing you want to do is try and see the fish. Get the guide to point the fish out to you. Try and get eyes on it. That makes life so much easier. If you're going to make a cast, especially in windy conditions, which it normally is on the flats, it is really so much easier if you can see where it is you're trying to put the fly. So once you've spotted the fish, say you've seen the green back or the slightly gray back coming across the flat, then what do you do? Then you want to try and lead the fish. A bit like shooting or something like that. You want to try and put that fly where you think the fish is going. Not where it is now, because bonefish move, they travel. Even when they're feeding in schools, they do move. So normally I would try and give a fish in probably six inches of water, I want to try and give that fish probably a couple of feet lead. Put the fly down gently as you can, make your first cast your best cast. Bonefish are pretty robust, but at the same time, they are a wild animal and they can get quite skittish. So you don't want to spook them because otherwise you could just spook not just the fish you're targeting, but the entire school. And we've certainly seen that happen. Big splash, flesh goes off, hand in, face in hand. Oh, guide looks at you. Moving on. So that's, that's very important. Put the fly down gently, let it sink, let it sink down onto the bottom. Bonefish are not used to looking at their, for their prey up in the water column. They are used to looking for their prey on the bottom. That is where they are targeting, that's where they are looking. Fly is sunk, fish is coming in, what do you do then? I like to give the fly one short, sharp strip. And what that does is it normally creates a puff of sand as the fly moves and then the fly settles again. That normally is enough for a bonefish to immediately track onto the fly. It can see exactly where its prey is. It'll come over and then hopefully it'll tip down on top of the fly. Don't trout set. I say this because this is the biggest thing that you have to learn when you move into saltwater fishing. 
don't trout set. I know it's hard, and especially if you come from fresh water, it's an instinctual muscle memory reaction. Bring the rod up. The guide will tell you to strip. So you're going to strip six inch strips, depending on the speed, and he'll say strip, 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 strip. And then if the fish comes and tails on the fly, all you're going to feel is a solid bang on the end of that line. You just keep stripping. We call it a strip set or a strip strike. So you give one little slightly faster jab and when the fish is going away and you are running the line through your hands, that is when you can bring the rod up, not before. Because if you do, what will happen is as you strike, the fly pops out of the fish's mouth and comes up in the water column. Which means that even if it sinks again, quite often the fish has lost it and can't track it. If you are stripping and you carry on stripping in that manner, even if the fish doesn't take the fly the first time, it may well then come onto it and hit it second or third time because it's still chasing it. It's used to chasing crustaceans, don't forget. So once you've strip set, then what you do, the fish is on, woohoo, it's all game on, then what happens? Now you have to concentrate on clearing your line. This is where the speed of the bonefish will somewhat take you by surprise if you have not done this before. As the fish races off, because as soon as you hook a bone, they absolutely go. They go wild across the flats. What I tend to do is keep my loose line in a loop in my fingers, and then I hold that away from my rod. And what that does is it keeps the line away from all of my accoutrements hanging off my belt and all of the rest of it, and it also stops it getting wrapped around the rod butt and I've seen more fish snapped off that way than any other. So keep it loose, and as it finishes and comes on, you want to get this on the reel if you can, and then you bring your hands in, and then, then do not palm your reel. This is another thing that people do all the time. As soon as you palm your reel, you are very likely going to snap that tippet because that fish is absolutely herring off. So let the reel do the work. This is where the drag on the reel is so vital. So let that fish take the line. What you want to concentrate on that point, you see the direction that the fish is moving in. If the fish is moving onto the right hand side, keep it up and to the left. And especially if you're in a coral area, you want to keep that rod nice and high because then you've got a better angle and you're less likely to get cut off on the coral area. So especially if you're on the reef edge, say you're know, in the Seychelles or you're um, at Ternif Atoll or one of those different destinations which has got corally edges, that's really a really useful tip. Keep that nice and high. Otherwise, if you're on a sand flat, lean in a bit, use the curvature of the rod, and then you can just gently let that fish take the line off the reel. No stress. Normally with bonefish, even a little one is gonna shoot off. You're gonna be down in your backing. Even with a little pound and a half, two pound fish, it will put you in your backing quite easily. The bigger ones, <clears throat> you're gonna be in for a serious battle. Normally you will get two or three really blistering runs out of a bonefish. And after that, normally they're sprinters and they're cooked then you need to concentrate on just winding in and keeping control with the fish. Keep it tight and keep tension on the fish, not too much that you are in danger of if it suddenly makes a wild run, it's gonna snap you off, but also not too little because otherwise you're gonna be there a really long time. You quite often see people holding the run up in there and you can just see the tip doing this and really they are applying absolutely no pressure to the fish at all. You've got this rod, you need to use it. So you can start working the angles on the fish and slowly but surely, you can bring it back towards you and at that point, your guide will either hand tail or net it. Keep it in the water. We all talk about this all the time. It's so important these days, especially with bonefish for their survival rate. Keep it in the water. If you're gonna get a picture, get yourself set up while it's in the water, lift it quickly for the photograph and then put it back and release it. Congratulations, you've just caught your first bonefish. If this looks like it is something that you would like to do, then please, I would implore you to go and do it. Going into the salt and saltwater fly fishing, especially for bonefish, changed my life. And the number of people who have then, then poo-pooed them and said, oh, I don't want to go and fish for bonefish anymore. They're not interesting and they're too easy. Then you can step it up a gear. If you head out to somewhere like St. Brandon's or one of these other destinations with some really big bonefish, they behave like permit. They are difficult to fool, big flies, deeper water, and they go like the clappers. As always, I hope you found this video useful. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. And if you have any other top tips that you'd like to share that I've missed out, 
please leave them in the comments below. I'd be interested to see them.